Good morning. Let's uh, try to get started on time today because as uh, you might remember, we have an exam Friday. Um, so today we're going to talk about NMR applications and just some stuff that's hopefully interesting and maybe ties some things together that we've been looking at. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of problems that might be on the exam. But I'm happy to answer general sorts of questions about it right now if anyone has them. Yes, in the back. So yeah, do you have a summary of your, uh, like your lectures and how they match with which, which sections in the book? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you suggest doing all the problems in the book too in those sections? Because some of them seem kind of irrelevant to your uh, lecture slides. Well, so, so are you talking about the problems I assigned or the rest of the problems in the book? The, not, not the problems you assigned, the ones in the book, like example problems. Okay, yeah, there are a bunch of example problems in the book. There are things in the book that we did not go over at all, and that's just fine. So, I mean, for instance, in chapter 11, there's a whole bunch of stuff about how lasers work. And it's neat, and I hope you read it. It's, you know, it's, it's nice for your information, but um, you're not going to be tested on it because we didn't cover it at all. We don't have time to do everything. So if you want extra practice problems from the book, I would say look for ones that are similar to ones I assigned or similar to things that we did in class, and then that might give you a good idea of which ones are good to do. There are definitely some that aren't going to help you with specifically the exam material. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The uh, the Hermit polynomials. If you need to know them, yeah, I will. Okay. For the most part, I'm not going to give you equations, but something like that where you need a giant table of wave functions, you're not expected to know that. I will say, if uh, you know, if you need to pull out your Chem 1 notes and go over molecular orbitals of diatomic molecules and, you know, remember which way the sigma and pi orbitals go in energy for different uh, diatomic molecules. This is a good time to review that. Um, there was another question over here. We don't need to draw, like, molecular orbitals right? Uh, where did you get that idea? Where, where did you get the idea that you don't need to draw molecular orbital yeah. diagrams? I'm asking you, like, do we need to draw them and do that in the exam? Yeah, I just said if you need to review that, make sure you go review it before the exam. So, I mean, the exam question is not going to be draw the molecular orbital diagram of, you know, fluorine, but in order to come up with term symbols for diatomic molecules, you're going to need to know things like the symmetries of the, the different molecular orbitals. And so I'm just recommending that's a good thing to review if you don't remember. Yes? That's one of the, so for the term symbols, mm -hmm. for, you know, uh, oxygen, so oxygen is paramagnetic, right? Yep. Um, in one of them, it's the same electron configuration, but the term symbol is different. Yep. I was wondering why one of them is a negative and one of them is a positive. And I, I know it has to do with the symmetry of, uh, of the orbitals, whether they, yeah, the parity. So but for the positive, I'm not sure why. Well, so, so plus and minus. So I think a lot of this I'm going to, uh, uh, the really specific questions I'm going to defer to office hours and the review session tonight. Okay. But the, the plus and minus refers to, that, you know, that I can answer quickly. It refers to the symmetry about a reflection plane that's through the internuclear axis. So remember, G and U is whether it's even and odd with respect to inversion. And then plus and minus is like you have your two nuclei and then there's a plane going, you know, containing the internuclear axis and you reflect it top to bottom there. And if you get the same thing, it's plus, and if you get a negative sign, it's minus. So that's, that's how you tell that. And so, you know, if you, if you can remember all this stuff and do it in your head and you get the right answer, that's fantastic. But if you don't remember, you know, whether these molecular orbitals are G and U off the top of your head, you might need to draw the picture and look at it. And so you, sh you might want to make sure that you can do that relatively quickly. You know, you don't, you don't have to to get credit, but, you know, it's, that's one really good way to figure it out. And also, if you, the more of your work you show, the more partial credit you'll get if you happen to make a mistake. Um, other things I should mention 
the rules are the same as last time. You get a cheat sheet. Um, you can use your calculator. Please don't store a bunch of text in your calculator. That's cheating, but using it as a calculator is just fine. Um, what else? We need to post the seating chart, but that'll be up today or tomorrow. Everybody did a pretty good job last time about getting in and, and getting seated. Please try to, to do it even more efficiently this time. Um, the exam is kind of long again, so no, this is, this is good actually, I swear, because if I, don't, if I don't test, I do it on purpose. I'd rather have it be a little long so that everyone runs out of time rather than have to be more selective about what to put on it because it's a more effective measure of what everybody knows. So if I, for instance, if I only put NMR spectroscopy on it, but it's really short, if that's the one thing you didn't understand, then you're gonna do really badly, and it's not very fair because it didn't test the other, all the other things that we went over. So I'd rather put more different things on it and measure what everyone knows more effectively, and yeah, that means everyone's gonna run out of time and it'll be a little stressful, but it's a, it's a better measure of what people can do. So, you know, just make sure that we all try to get here on time and, and get organized quickly. You guys did a pretty good job of that last time. Yes? Did you say that there is a review session? There is a review session. Um, John, Mark, and Jerry are doing that, and it's tonight, and it's, um, it starts at 8 o'clock. And what room is it in, you guys? I don't remember. 104 Roland? Okay, good. All right, so any other general kinds of uh, questions about the exam? It's going to cover rotational and vibrational spectroscopy, things like interpreting spectra. So we didn't do all of that uh, before we cut off for the end of uh, the material for midterm one. It, there will be selection rules. How do you know which transitions happen and which ones don't? You'll have to calculate or at least write down Frank Condon factors for electronic transitions. There will be some, some things like looking at a spectrum and inferring what the energy level diagram of the system looks like and vice versa. Stuff like that. You need to know about NMR, um, both in terms of looking at matrices for the, the uh, angular momentum operators and also, you know, so the quantum mechanical representation of NMR on a, you know, on a pretty basic level. We, um, we haven't gotten that far into it, but there is going to be a little bit. And also being able to draw NMR spectra that are taken under various conditions. Question. Um, when do we use the transition dipole and when do we use the Frank Condon factor? Okay, so that's, uh, that's a good question. So, the, so I, I wrote an unclear question on this. So the transition, when, you're, when you were using the transition dipole, that's just telling us, okay, is this transition allowed or not? It's a yes or no question. Just are we going to see a signal? Yes or no, that's it. The Frank Condon factor tells us the, it tells us something about the amplitude of the signal that we're going to see. And so, you know, you could, you could also get from the Frank Condon factor that the amplitude of that signal is going to be zero because the states have zero overlap. But it will also, if it's not zero, that will give us an actual number for the, the uh, intensity of the spectrum. So I will try to be extremely clear about what I'm asking for in those kinds of questions. Um, again, for this exam, I recommend reading the directions really carefully because there are a lot of things where I have set things up a certain way to try to save you time. So it is long, but there are things that could take even more time if you don't follow the directions. So please do, if you don't understand them, feel free to ask us. The, you know, the worst case scenario is we're going to say, sorry, I'm not going to answer that question right now, but you can ask. I'd rather have everybody understand what's going on than not. Okay, so is that it? Should we? All right, one more. Uh, how do we ask in the process of taking the exam? Just raise your hand and wait till. Uh, yeah, just raise your hand. I mean, we're, we're pretty good at looking around and, and catching people's questions. We can't have everybody getting up and running around. So, you know, please just raise your hand and stay in your seat, and we'll come around and talk to you. All right, let's talk about NMR. So, last time, 
at the end, I um, talked about two-dimensional NMR and as by extension, multi-dimensional NMR and how we use this to go about solving structures of molecules. And we saw a simple example of an amino acid and a complex example of uh, a two-dimensional spectrum of a protein. I want to show you a little bit more about how we actually solve structures of molecules using this. So when we go through this process, we start with two-dimensional or three-dimensional or even higher dimensional spectra. And then we have to go through these collections of spectra and assign them. So we determine specifically which amino acid, which amino acid in the sequence do these particular peaks belong to. And again, you need highly multidimensional spectra to do that. You have to walk through the, the backbone. And you can recognize particular spin systems and say, OK, that's, that belongs to a valine. And then if you go across the backbone, looking at you know, HCN kind of experiments and, and going th through the, the protein uh, backbone, then you see, all right, now I have a valine next to an isoleucine. And you can start to eliminate like how many sites in the protein contain that sequence. And you made the protein, so you know that. And so we go through and walk through the whole sequence and come up with a, an address for every proton, carbon, and nitrogen. Then we use some additional, more long-range experiments to measure some restraints on the three-dimensional structure. So here what we're interested in doing is measuring things like dipolar couplings, if it's a solid or an oriented sample, or NOE's nuclear Oberhauser effect cross-relaxation terms. These are things that tell us about the distance between one part of the protein and another. So now we'll have, say, a dipolar <coughs> coupling between a valine that's on one side of the protein in the amino acid chain and a tryptophan that's somewhere else in the primary sequence. And the only way that they can be close together is because the protein is folded up. And so these restraints tell us more about the, the distance. Of course, since we have a whole lot of them, we can't measure the distances very precisely. If we had a specifically labeled sample with one C13 and one N15, we could measure the dipolar coupling between those two nuclei and get the distance between them to many, many decimal places, and we would have a very precise number. People do that. It's a useful experiment. However, for protein structure determination or anything that's, that's moderately complicated, it's not so good. Because in that case, if I'm doing a proton carbon correlation, if I put in, if I transfer magnetization from protons to carbon, they don't just transfer magnetization to the carbon they're directly attached to. That magnetization also leaks all around and gets diffused to different points in the, the protein because we have a lot of protons in C13 and N15 all around. And so that means that we get more information, which is a good thing, but it dilutes our magnetization and we don't have these really precise distances. So what do we do? We basically take these, these dis instead of having these distance measurements very precisely, we kind of bin them into small, medium, and large, essentially. So we can say, all right, these pairs of residues are very close together. Here are some that are in the middle, and here are some other ones that are really far apart. And then we feed all of this to a molecular dynamics type simulation that, put, that uses those measurements as restraints on the structure. And so one of them on its own is not very precise, but because we have thousands of them, you can put all that in an MD simulation, minimize the energy, and hopefully get uh, a reasonable structure out of it. And then, of course, you, know, you get this family of structures, and we have to go back through and check. Some of these things end up being wrong. The assignments are wrong, things like that. And we iterate through a bunch of times and then eventually get a structure that looks like uh, it's starting to converge. So this is how you solve an NMR structure. We've talked about crystal structures before, you know, where we're diffracting x-rays and then sol you know, solving an electron density map. There are crystal structures and NMR structures in the protein data bank. And you know, they're all in there. You, know, you can kind of put anything you want in the PDB. But they're different kinds of structures. They give you different information because they're, they're measured quite differently. And they're, they're really complementary. So a crystal structure tells you, like it's a snapshot of a protein that's 
more or less immobilized because it's in this rigid crystal lattice. And it gives you a really high resolution, hopefully if the data is good, picture of where all the atoms are. But it doesn't tell you about other things like mobility. So in an NMR structure, so notice that you know, this, this particular protein, which is uh, it's gamma S crystal, and this was solved in my lab, um, it has this, this tail on the bottom. That's the N-terminal end. And you can see that in the family of structures, it doesn't quite converge. It's, it's flopping around all over the place. You can say, you know, well, that's not as nice as a crystal structure where everything's locked down. But that's kind of missing the point. This is telling you information. It's telling us that, in fact, that N-terminal tail is flopping around. It's mobile, as opposed to the C-terminal tail, which you can see over on the right, which is kind of tucked up into the protein, and it has a really well-defined conformation. So these are two different ways to get structures, and they're really complementary. So going back to the process of how we get this, if we look at some, uh, some correlations, so I mentioned that we can see individual spin systems and identify what kind of amino acid it is. Here's a, a multidimensional sequence called a toxy that tells us, you know, here we've got proton chemical shifts and carbon chemical shifts correlated. If you're used to looking at these things, you know, there's only 20 amino acids that come up in normal proteins. You get really good at seeing the, the patterns for the, the spin system and identifying the amino acids. So one of the first things that you do is go through something like a toxy and identify the, the proton carbon correlations and see, you know, just label things as to types of amino acids. So, you know, here are just some, you know, some examples of stuff that we can see where it is because of the, the chemical shift. So, for instance, these, um, the beta protons, the CH2s, show up at, you know, between 2 and 3 ppm in the proton dimension. <coughs> Same thing with these uh, gamma protons. And then we can walk through the backbone. So now each of these slices is from a three-dimensional spectra. So we've got, we've got uh, proton and, and uh, carbon chemical shift again. And we're going through the backbone. And each of these lines that I'm drawing is a correlation between amino acids that are next to each other in sequence. And so we know exactly what's next to what. And remember, we make the protein, so we know the primary sequence. If you took a protein of unknown sequence and gave it to an NMR spectroscopist and said, here, solve the structure, we would have a really hard time. It's, uh, it's not something you can typically do. All right, so here's an example of a, a structure that was solved using this kind of technique you know, with some representative data. Um, this protein is called Mystic. It's a membrane protein that helps other membrane proteins fold up, so it's, uh, it's very popular in NMR labs. This one was not solved in my group. This is from uh, Roland Reek's group. And I want to point this out because we can do these kind of correlations between nuclei, not only among nuclei that are in the same molecule, but we can do it across interfaces between two molecules. So one of the things that, that uh, Roland Reek's group did in this structure is they looked at correlations between the protein and particular parts of the membrane. And so they were able to learn a lot about exactly how it's sitting in the membrane from looking at the NMR structure. Okay, so that's one application of NMR, look, you know, looking at uh, where we can go with it beyond identifying simple molecules. I want to talk about another one again. So we've seen this slide before, looking at the relative sizes of interactions. And we're going to come back to the quadrupole interaction. So we just kind of brush it off as, you know, hey, you don't really see it in liquids except that it makes the it makes adjacent nuclei relax. But if we're talking about solid state NMR, and particularly materials, quadrupolar nuclei are really important. There's a whole field of looking at complex solid materials that's, that's extremely important in chemical engineering in particular, and, and also physical chemistry, where people develop techniques to look at quadrupolar nuclei. OK, so here's a periodic table showing the NMR nuclei, and everything that is blue has only spin one half nuclei, and everything that's white 
has no NMR active nuclei or it's so radioactive that it doesn't stick around long enough to tell. And everything that's in pink is something that has a quadrupolar nucleus. And so, you know, when I say different, different uh, elements can have different kinds of nuclei that could be spin one half or quadrupole, notice that hydrogen kind of has both. That's because it has different isotopes. So it has protons, which are spin one half, and then it also has deuterium, which are spin one. So some of these things do have both. But even given that, if you look at the periodic table, a whole bunch of the nuclei that are, that are there are quadrupolar. They have spin greater than one half. And if we weren't able to study that and deal with those, we'd be missing out on a lot of what's going on in, in chemistry, particularly in inorganic chemistry and materials kinds of applications. OK, so what does it mean that something is quadrupolar? Um, a quadrupolar nucleus is something that doesn't have a spherical distribution of charge in the nucleus. And you know, what, is it, what exactly does that mean? What's the structure of the nucleus look like? That's beyond the scope of, of what we're doing, and you have to get into uh, some serious nuclear physics to, to understand exactly what's going on. But we can understand it on a conceptual level. So the quadrupolar moment of the nucleus is, interact is interacting with the electric field gradient. And that's what produces some uh, interesting line shapes that can give us information about the structure of the material or you know, make the spectra really messy depending on what's going on. This interaction is anisotropic. It depends on the orientation with respect to the magnetic field. You know, we've talked about things like dipolar couplings and uh, chemical shift anisotropy. All of these things behave as a second rank tensor with respect to the magnetic field. So that means that we can spin about the magic angle and average them out. The magic angle, I don't know if we, if we talked about this before. Did I tell you about magic angle spinning or, or no? No? OK. There's a little section about it in your book. So essentially what it is, is we have these interactions that behave as a second rank tensor, dipolar coupling, chemical shift and isotropy, magnetic susceptibility differences, things like that. And in a liquid, these all average out because the molecules are moving around isotropically on the time scale of the experiment. In a solid, that's not true. They're stuck in some rigid place, you know, whether it's a crystal or a glass or something like that, and they're not averaged out by the environment. So if we just took a spectrum of a static solid, a lot of times we would see a big mess because we have these very complicated interactions that are all overlapping. If we want to simplify that spectrum, then often what we do is we'll spin at the magic angle. And all that is is the angle where the second order Legendre polynomial happens to go to zero. And you can think about it in a simple geometric way like this. If you imagine a cube, so you're, you have your XYZ coordinate system and there's a cube, draw a line between two vertices of the cube that are farthest apart and think about that angle. That's the magic angle. So if we spin about that, we're averaging in the x, y, and z direction all equally. And so that helps us get rid of a lot of these interactions that, are, that behave as second rank tensors in space. So the quadrupolar interaction is more complicated than that. It behaves as a fourth rank tensor, at least the, the second order quadrupole term does. And so spinning at the magic angle doesn't make it go away completely because there's not just, there's not just one degree of freedom. You, need, you would need two de degrees of freedom to average it out completely. So one way you can do that is by spinning at two different angles during the experiment. And people have done that. We actually do it in my lab for different reasons. Or you can use techniques where one of the averaging processes is done in actual space and the other one is done in spin space. All of that is a little more uh, advanced than we're going to get for now, but let's, let's just look at what the interactions look like. OK, so here's what the quadrupolar Hamiltonian looks like. So there's a dependence on the electric quadrupole moment, which again has to do with this field gradient. And it also depends on 
the spin quantum number for this nucleus. So that could be, it goes in increments of a half. So it could be three halves, it could be one, it could be seven halves. There are, there are uh, quadrupolar nuclei with all kinds of different spin quantum numbers. It also depends on this electric field gradient tensor. And so here's what we get for something like a spin one nucleus. So instead of just having two possible levels of, uh, two possible values for the, the spin angular momentum, you know, we can have, for a spin one half, we have plus or minus one half, and we interpret that as up or down relative to the magnetic field. If we have a spin one, that has these three states with m sub l values of one, zero, and minus one. And so that means that when we look at its NMR spectrum, if we just have one nucleus and it's a spin one, it's going to give us a doublet because it has these two possible transitions. And so what would it be nice for you to know about this at this point as far as quadrupolar nuclei? You should know that they exist. You should know what their spin states look like. And you should be able to do simple things like write matrix elements for operators like IZ and I plus and I minus, stuff, you know, stuff like that that we went over in class, the, you know, the simple ones, in these kind of bases. And that is about it. Oh, yeah, I guess the other thing is you should also be able to draw NMR spectra for them, as we did in some of the homework problems where you said, all right, you have, a, you have a spin one half coupled to a spin three halves. What did the spectra look like? You should know how to do those. But that's about it. So let me tell you a little bit about an application of this uh, that we work on in my group. So again, the main application of this in, you know, out in the field is solids, you know, mater materials that, uh, you know, aluminosilicate glasses are, are popular ones, but all kinds of materials where the, the state that you want to look at is a solid and you know, not necessarily a crystal, so you can't do crystallography. Zeolites, um, all kinds of uh, things like that. Here's an example from my group. Um, so we don't work on, on uh, solid materials except for proteins occasionally. But one thing that we use quadrupolar nuclei for is looking at orientation in biomolecules in the context of membranes. So we want to look at membrane proteins stuck in a membrane in, their, in as close to native-like conditions as we can. Membrane proteins are really important, and it's, uh, it's very useful to have their structures. So you see numbers thrown around like membrane proteins make up a third of the proteome and something like 60% of all drug targets. And the reason for that is that, you know, these are really what's, what are allowing things to pass in and out of our cells, including information. So all of our senses are, you know, the, the antennas for those are membrane proteins, for instance, and all kinds of other things involving transporting food into the cell, waste out of the cell, all of that. It all goes through membrane proteins. So it's really useful to be able to solve their structures and, you know, figure out how to design drugs to interact with them. However, it's difficult to get their structures because they don't crystallize very easily. They need interaction with membranes. And also, looking at them by solution state on MR is really difficult because they have to be stuck in membranes. So we're interested in developing NMR techniques to do this. So one of the things that we do, you know, and other groups do this as well, it's a, it's a pretty large field. We're interested in putting these membrane proteins in membrane mimetics that are tractable to NMR, but they're realistic enough. And so um, the system that we often use for that, that's, that's uh, again, pretty common, is this mixture of short chain and long chain lipids that self-assemble into oriented membrane domains. And here, you know, I'm, I'm showing them as little cartoons, little disks that align in the magnetic field. They don't look exactly like this. But one of the tricks that we use <clears throat> with deuterated molecules is that we put D2O in with our bicell systems. And, you know, again, deuterium is a spin one. So if it's in an anisotropic environment where everything is not getting averaged out by the molecular motion, then 
we'll see a doublet. And so when we want to map out what kinds of phase transitions the bicells are undergoing, you know, we're interested in having a system that is aligned so that we can stick our membrane protein in it and do NMR on it. If you look at this cartoon, you know, again, they don't look exactly like that, but, you, but the, the important part is if you have these mixtures at low concentration, we get tiny little micelles that are no good because the protein won't fit in there in its native conformation. And if we get all the way up to high temperature, we have large vesicles, which are, again, no good because they're heterogeneous. You know, we're not going to see a good alignment of our sample. Each protein isn't going to be in the same environment. And in between, we get these oriented systems that are useful for looking at the protein structure. And so the way we measure that is we throw in D2O, and we take spectra of the deuterium. So, you know, again, a lot of times you hear about, you know, you take your NMR spectra of organic molecules in deuterated solvents because you don't want to see a bunch of, pro of protons from the solvent, and so you think that deuterium is silent to NMR. It's not. It's a good NMR nucleus. It's just that it's a spin one, and so if we want to look at it, we have to tune the probe to a different frequency and actually investigate the deuterium. And so here we're just using the D2O as a probe to spy on the, the bicells and tell us whether they're oriented or not. You could also put deuterium on the lipid molecules themselves, and people do that, but it's really expensive as opposed to throwing in D2O, which is cheap. So it's, uh, it makes a good starting point for this kind of study. It's cheap and it's easy. We can tell whether things are, are oriented or not. So that enables us to do things like uh, look at, you know, here's a protein from a thermophilic organism that if you see here in our, in our particular bicell recipe that we made, you know, the details are too much to go into for right now, but if we look at this at 55 degrees, the distance between the two peaks of the doublet is really far apart. That means we have a lot of orientation in the sample. And that enables us to look at this thermophilic protein at a temperature that's close to its operative temperature, which is important. You know, we want to be able to study these things at the temperature where they're actually active. Okay, so I pronounce us done with NMR. And, um, you know, so basically that's everything that, <clears throat> that we need to know for the second midterm. Give me a second to get the document camera thing set up and let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the kinds of, uh, of problems that there might be. Okay, can you see that? Is that, is that good? All right, so obviously we don't have time in the 15 minutes or whatever that's left to go over, <clears throat> you know, all the kinds of problems that could be on the exam. But I just want to start sort of close to, to the end of what we talked about and where we've had maybe a little bit less time to practice. And go over a few of these problems. So sort of the last thing that we've, uh, that we've talked about is NMR. So let's look at that. 
Okay, so um, the idea here is, well, let's look at, at part B here. Professor, yeah. will this go up on the website? Um, my lectures are always posted on the website. Okay. The, there's a video. Okay. Am I going to scan this piece of paper and put it on the website? No, but there is a video. Um, Okay, so the idea is we want to look at the carbon decoupled NMR spectrum of this molecule. And so let's look at how we want to uh, draw this. So it's a proton spectrum, so the first thing you want to do is label your axis. So chemical shift, <coughs> proton, PPM, zero goes over here, and it's going to end around 12. That's an important part of the problem. Um, things that you should be worried about when you're predicting the NMR spectrum of a, of a compound. One is how many protons are there that are non-equivalent? And you know, make sure that you read the directions really carefully. So in this particular case, um, I remember when I gave this exam, it was, uh, it was a couple years ago, I said, you know, sketch the, carbon, sketch the spectrum of the, this molecule, and some people only wrote down the uh, answer for the protons that are labeled A and B, but, uh, you know, they didn't read the directions. You, you, in this case, it was draw the whole thing. So just, you know, make sure you're Make sure you're actually following what the, the question is asking for. Okay, so how many protons do we have that are inequivalent? Um, what do you think? How many different kinds of them do we have? Yeah, so we've got these guys and this one. And what do you think? Are this one and that one equivalent? No, right, because of, of, uh, of symmetry. Okay, so the next thing that we want to worry about is the chemical shift. And one thing that I am going to give you as part of this exam is a basic table of chemical shifts as far as where different functional groups show up for protons because I'm not really worried about anyone memorizing those numbers. I'm also just kind of, I'm going to roughly stick them in at this point. The main thing I'm worried about in that is getting stuff sort of in the right order as far as, as where it falls on the spectrum. You know, so I'm not going to argue with anyone about whether something shows up at 7 ppm or 7.5 ppm. It's, it's not important. The important thing is getting things in, in roughly the right places, and I will give you a table to use for that. Okay, so first let's look at the methyl groups. So those are going to be over here, you know, close to to um, zero or between zero and two, say. And so we've got two of them. What do you think? Which one is going to be closer to zero? This one or, or this one? The bottom one? Yeah, how do you know? Yeah, you guys are all on top of this. We, uh, I, I shouldn't have worried that, uh, that, we're, that we need to spend a lot of time on it. Okay, so. The first one we're, is we're going to draw is this bottom one. So that's going to go somewhere, you know, we'll put it at one point something ppm, say, um, you know, maybe around two, what are, you know, we'll, we'll guess down here somewhere. Um, we also have to worry about splittings. Okay, so what is the signal of that going to look like? Is it going to be a singlet or a doublet or a triplet or what? Yeah, it's a triplet. So we have All right, so we called those A and B. I'm going to call this C D E F. Yes, that's arbitrary, but uh, that's fine. Okay, so this is E. Um, 
now how about our other methyl group here, B? So we already said it shows up a little bit farther to the left than uh, the other one. What does its signal look like? Yep, it's a singlet because it, um, it is not split by anything. OK, so then the next thing, we have some uh, aliphatic proton here. So that's the, or that's the uh, CH2. And that's split by its neighbor, the methyl group. So it's going to be a quartet. And that's you know in here somewhere. And again, this is sort of the level of uh, you know care that I expect with the you know with exactly where you put the uh, the chemical shift. Questions? Professor, how is the CH two less uh, heat shielded than the whole CH three? Like it's it's more towards downfield. You are so right. I was not thinking of those things altogether. So yeah, these are. These are issues you can have. But again, I'm going to give you a table of that, so it'll, it'll be hopefully easier to keep track of. Yes? Sorry, uh, small, 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 small question. Um, depending on the agent, do we have to like, uh, take, take into account the, the lens of the signal? Like you know, it's, at some point, it just gets too hard to draw. So yeah, ideally, if you had all the time in the world, you should draw, the, draw them so that they're the same you know, so that the relative intensities indicate how many there are. But in reality here, like, on this quality of a drawing telling the difference between one proton and three, I'm just not so concerned about it. So yeah, it's, it, ideally you should know that, but it's, uh, it's not necessary to try to indicate it with the drawing. OK, so we've got our, our, um, <clears throat> our methyl and aliphatic protons, and then I'm going to draw a break in the middle of this axis because now I've got everything all spread out. And so I want to indicate that there's some stuff in the middle before we get to you know, the aromatic protons. And so those are all going to be sort of over here. And as far as what order you get them in, you know, for again, for this, this level of problem, as long as you get something reasonable, it's fine. They're, they're all going to be pretty close together. And you know, here, two of them are going to be doublets because they're split by you know, one neighbor. And the one in the middle is going to be a doublet of doublets. And here's something about intensities that I do actually want to see. So we have um, a quartet. Looks like the middle ones are higher intensity. And a doublet of doublets has all of them the same height. And so I, you know, I would like to see that as uh, you know, crude as the drawing is going to be. I'd like to see that you understand that. And so I just wanted to go through this to show, you know, I know these problems where you have to draw something are kind of hard. I want to show sort of what level of detail I expect and you know, what kinds of things are not necessarily going to really uh, count against you at this point, because I know you have a finite amount of time, and you can't do everything in the, the time constraints. So I'm worried about, you know, do you get it roughly in the right place as far as chemical shift? You're going to have a table, and getting the splitting patterns right. Question? Well, I was just wondering, how, how did you know whether it's going to be, whether that photon would be a triplet or a doublet of doublets? Well, so a doublet of doublets means it's split by one neighbor over here and then another neighbor over here. So it's split by two non-equivalent protons. If it's a quartet, then it's split by three equivalent protons. Yeah, so it's a, it's a different effect. Yes? So if this molecule was symmetrical through like an HBR axis, those two protons would be identical and then it would be a triplet. Yep. So that's, that is true if it were. If it were identical, then it would have two identical neighbors. OK, so now let's look at the next one. OK, so we said explain the splitting pattern of the resonance of proton A. So proton A, we said, is a doublet of doublet. 
And then the question is, don't just describe it, explain the physical reason for the effect. So just describing it would be, you write down, it's a doublet of doublets. You know, okay, but that doesn't say that you understand exactly what's going on. So you would need to say something like, it's split by two non-equivalent neighbors. And you know, even better if you mention that the reason for the splitting is that either one, that's, its neighbors can be either up or down, and that adds to or subtracts from the main magnetic field. So this is definitely the kind of stuff that, that you might see come up. Let's see what else do we have uh, in relationship to this. I might uh, also ask you about things like, here I mentioned that um, we are quickly running out of time. I had a huge plan for all the examples that we could go over, and of course this stuff always takes longer than, than I thought, so we'll have to do some of that in office hours, and you know, maybe I'll share some of it with the TAs to use at the review session as well. Um, okay, so we also have, uh, we don't have time to do the whole thing, but let's just talk through it a little bit. This last question, sketch the A and X NMR spectra for an AX2 spin system where A is a spin one, X is a spin one half, and the J coupling is 25 hertz. So, okay, so what this should tell you is that, you know, they're called A and X. That means there are two different types of nuclei, so they don't show up in the same spectrum. So the A spectrum and the X spectrum are, are different things. So, you know, maybe the A is a deuterium and, uh, or maybe it's an N14. I guess that's a more realistic example. And X could be proton. And so you're not going to see the N14 and the proton in the same spectrum, so you have to draw two separate things. And so, you know, here's our, our axis. I didn't tell you what nucleus this is, so you can't uh, get too excited about the actual values. But you know that without the splitting, A is a spin one. And so it's going to have a doublet if it's just by itself. If it had no interaction with anything, it would have a doublet. Then we know that it's split by two protons. And so each of those protons are going to split it into, you know, it's going to be split into a triplet, but it had two peaks to begin with. So here's what that looks like. It's a doublet of triplets. And the J coupling is 25 hertz. So that's this distance between them. And I will let you figure out the second part of the problem. How do you draw the proton spectrum when it's split by that spin one? OK, we are out of time. Um, if you want to do more examples, come to office hours today and tomorrow. Um, go to the review session. <laughs>